Frost, you know, I've hit the go live button and it's always a matter of kind of crossing your fingers and hoping that we are up and at them. Um, hey, we're kicking it over on YouTube. We are hanging out on Twitch. I think we got a little bit of LinkedIn love in there just as well. Um, but thanks so much, everyone that might happen to be tuning in. Uh, I am super excited to be hanging out with a couple of friends and folks and, and gentlemen here. Uh, but we're chatting about successfully launching your NFT, talking about the security aspect of it, uh, the tokenomics, integrating things and more. Um, but hey, I am not uh, really the folks that we want to see here. The star of the show is all around me. So I'll let everyone take it away. Uh, Rohan, do you mind just kind of introducing yourself for everyone listening in, who you are, what you're up to? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great to meet you all. My name is Rohan Honda. I'm the head of business development here at Horizon Labs. So Horizon Labs is a crypto and blockchain solution develop, developer, helping bring the age of Web3 and crypto and blockchain solutions to the world. And more recently, we've partnered with the Bode Ape Yacht Club team to help launch their ApeCoin token. Awesome. Steve, how so, are you? Uh, Steven Wabrell, one of the co-founders from Halborn. Uh, Halborn is a cybersecurity company, and we focus on blockchain, NFTs, smart contracts, and really we're a group of hackers that go to, to uh, hack, find what's wrong, what kind of vulnerabilities, exploits there are to protect it. So we worked uh, you know, and partnered with Horizon Labs to, to do the ApeCoin launch there as well and make sure it was successful among hundreds of other projects that you may have heard of, different coins, different tokens, different exchanges. And um, you know, we have a team of experts here like Roberto, who's uh, one of our senior engineers here for all this. And uh, I'll let him talk. He's the brains behind all of the different hacks that NFTs have. So yeah, uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, I am Roberto and I work here in Halvor as a senior offensive security engineer. And I am mostly focused on auditing solidity smart contracts and especially projects related to NFTs, pay to play games and metaverse. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks so much, gentlemen. It's super cool to be uh, here with you all. And I'm excited to dive in on the conversation. Uh, Rohan, if it's all right, I'd probably like to start picking your brain right away. Uh, if we are thinking about launching your own NFT, what are the things that you particularly want to consider when, hey, you're selecting a blockchain or choosing how you're really going to go about this launch? Can you mind kind of setting the stage? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a great question to ask, given there's so much uh, activity within the NFT space as well. So I'll, I'll take that question in two pieces. Maybe the first one, um, I'll, I'll break it into what do you specifically look for in a partner when you're launching the NFT project? I believe that was the first part of the question, right? So but when you think about it, there are four key areas you want to dive into when you're looking for a launch partner. So first one is the team competence, right? Which goes into the understanding of the space itself. Um, is, there, is the team able to surface insights within the space and are they really able to provide the value that you really need to? go to market and you need to be able to provide clear advice from day zero. Second is the communication aspect, right? When you select these partners, you want to make sure you're able to communicate in a way that is in alignment with what you are envisioning to launch into the market. And it is pretty table stake, but more often than not, you're like, this is where a lot of bottleneck gets created. Um, the third is having the execution mentality. You know, because it's easy to pour the ocean within the space, but it's important to align uh, with partners who are not only able to creatively strategize, but also execute on, on that strategy and the vision the team brings to the table. And lastly, uh, what I just want to is, is simply a, a, a caution, uh, um, uh, pretty much, is like, do not let big names sort of hurt your project's reputation, right? Um, you want to be choosing partners that A, believe in your project, and B, are keen on truly being your partners in the long run. So I think that's where uh, my, my, my two cents, if you will, in terms of choosing the partner would be. That's awesome. Yeah, great. I'll give you the opportunity in case anyone else wanted to chime in on that. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. We, uh, at Halbor, we're the same way with like, you know, choosing partners, too. Um, we have a reputational risk sometimes with the partners because we're there to protect them. And what's really unique with uh, with the blockchain world and NFT world and you know this whole Web3 movement as far as security goes is a lot of this is like open to the public and open source and transparent. Um, John, you're you know cybersecurity industry very well. You know sometimes penetration test reports or audit reports they're you know, behind closed doors, top secret information, confidential. And uh, you know, for us, it's 
usually, you know, marketing materials or, you know, we have a GitHub full of all of our different audit results. And so all the findings that Roberto uh, has and, and our other engineers, you know, it's on, it's on public display. So, you know, if we end up doing security for, for a project and, you know, maybe the, uh, the, the development team doesn't take security too seriously or they're trying to rush through it all, you know, just release it out there, you know, that, that can become a risk, um, you know, for, for both parties as well. So, you know, choosing partners that really care about security, really care about what they're developing and what they're releasing. That's um, something that, that we look at, too, with security. So, I mean, with Horizon Labs, it has been like an absolute pleasure. You, uh, you guys are one of the, the, I think, most methodical, very security minded uh, organizations and the, the team there, too. So it's been a great pleasure, not only with doing the, the projects like the Board API Club and NFTs, but uh, just the, the people involved, too. So uh, something uh, kudos to, to you guys for, for taking security seriously. It made our job a pleasure. I love hearing all this kind of coming, hey, a little bit of the outside external perspective, right? But it's it's so cool in my mind to see where these kind of worlds collide and when, hey, we take cybersecurity and all this and it's applied to this Web3 movement and the cryptography and everything that we're up to. Uh, I, I have to ask, and I feel like I already know the answer to this, but I think it helps kind of continue to lay the foundation for what we're chatting about. Whether it's the Board Ape Yacht Club, whether it's Ape Token, et cetera, do all projects need security in some way, somehow, some more than others? Do you mind kind of filling that in just a little bit? Yeah, I can you know, speak of the security aspect of it. Uh, when we talk about NFTs in particular, because it's about you know how to secure your NFT launch. One thing about NFTs is it, it's a new technology. People are still trying to like understand like what is it? it it's non fungible token. And it doesn't have to be just like a collection of art pieces or some like, you know, uh, so rare, rare art or you know, piece of music. A non fungible token is anything that it could be, you know, proof of ownership, proof of authenticity. And there's a lot of use cases for it, not just with like you know, art pieces or collectibles. Um, you can think of it as you know, unique real world items, and you want to prove that this is the authentic one. Like if you buy, I don't know, like let's say, say my green alligator wallet here, it's one of one in the real world, customized here. Yeah, you know, I can have a private key going along with this to prove that it's the real one, the original, you know, there's providence of having a transfer of like, for me, if I sell it on eBay, I could transfer the key with it. Now the providence is written on there. So it's supposed to show that this can't be copied or replicated. There's no fraudulent, uh, you know, uh, unauthentic version of this one. That's that's a use case that, um, you know, I think is, is starting to come out and be very apparent where they're starting on chain, but can be applied there to supply chains, for example, or a large thing. So, um, that's a long way of answering it for NFT security is that, yes, uh, you wanted to make sure that the immutability of the blockchain stays intact and that um, the things that are the use cases and purpose of the NFT uh, is, you know, is sound. You know, it's not being copied. You can't break that logic or steal it or, you know, destroy the provenance of that and copy it. So um, that's all, you know, part of security. It's different aspects. Some are code vulnerabilities, some are use case and logical errors. Not only not only the NFT project, the, the smart contract itself, I think that needs security. We also need to take into account, I guess, you know, social networks, Twitter, Discord, uh, oh, yes. everywhere, pretty much everywhere. Uh, like lately, there was some uh, some hacking uh, in too many popular projects that uh, hackers made use of a, of a vulnerability that there was in a plugin that was used in, in Discord servers, and they managed to trick people into... Uh, into fake websites, phishing websites where people were minting uh, fake NFTs, right? So it's not only about the smart contract itself, uh, it's Social everywhere. engineering. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah, all aspects of it. And that's why, you know, at Halbor and Roberto and the, the team here, we, we look at all aspects of security, you know, end to end, whether it's uh, the, the community release, the, uh, the website. So, hey, you're listening on OpenSea and OpenSea had a vulnerability you know, for that, you know, a little while ago for um, the, the listed sales weren't, if they weren't canceled, you could go back and claim you know, a cheaper version of it all. That's, you know, a website or backend error. So there's a lot of facets. It's not just about like the, the code, um, like Roberto, you know, explained, it's, you've got to, you got to think of everything and look at the defense and depth for all of it for an NFT. Yeah, and I agree with both Steve and Roberto there just to say, you know, second it up. And that's why Albon is such a great partner when, when it comes to security, right? Because blockchain in general could be very vulnerable to a number of different attack 
vectors, right? This could include man in the middle attack. This could include 51% attacks. So some of these inevitable outcomes of an attack like this can include eventually your loss of access, right? Of data and of money. And that ultimately, uh, you know, where decentralization eventually gets compromised and mm -hmm. that, uh, that uh, you know, that restricts the possibility of more new players coming to the market and eventually hampers the project that's, that's, that's become vulnerable to those kind of attacks. It's super critical that we look into this at a much deeper level. Yeah, and also sometimes the, um, the vulnerabilities, if, if it's released early, because of the nature of blockchain and decentralization, it's, it's immutable, which means it's, it's, once it's written on chain, it doesn't come off chain, things can't be reversed. Uh, you know, speaking to NFTs in particular, you know, a lot of the, the hackers, and including myself, in the early days, you know, we tried to hack games like Half-Life or Diablo and, you know, like dupe the gold or make an extra skin that, you know, unlock that skin early. And, okay, that's, yeah, that's you hacked it, but it doesn't impact anybody. You just, it's on your computer. You know, it's like centralized there. It's no, like, real world, like, value that can be, um, like, taken from that. Now, if, uh, you know, some of the findings we have on some games, an NFT sword, that, yeah, I just bought this sword for like a $2,000, this NFT sword. And if the code is wrong, Roberto can go on there and burn that person's sword and burn that person, just like destroy all the items. And it's like, that was real money. And I can't get this back. And uh, so, you know, it's a whole new world of vulnerabilities now with, with when you bring NFTs into the mix on gaming. That's one of the most wild thing in my mind is that like, okay, uh, again, as you mentioned, Steve, and I, I, I come, I come personally from a little bit of that cybersecurity world in the, in the traditional sense, if I may say. Ooh. So when we take it to this stage, uh, it is, it's real money. Uh, there's <laughs> legitimate yeah. financial value that's sort of in the balance there. And that's, that's a crazy thing when, Hey, maybe we forgot a semicolon to completely <laughs> trivialize this, right? That, I, I, I'm, I'm playing nice, but oh, no, you're not, real it's, intentions. You're, it's not untrue. Um, <laughs> I think I did a talk with Sands about like how to lose a uh, $200 million with one line of code. And yep. it was uh, one line of code was, uh, you know, a parody wallet that the library got locked and everybody's multi-sig wallet was then pretty much bricked <laughs> forever. So, hey, let me throw another kind of softball here, if that's all right. Uh, when we're launching, right, at what point in the project, where should and how should security be a priority? Uh, I say this as sort of a softball, right? Is it, hell, we, maybe we're thinking about it right as we're flying by the seat of our pants, or is this something beginning before, during, after, et cetera? How is it baked in? Yeah. I could I could talk about how we think of it, and then maybe uh, Rohan can say you know how how they implement it uh, at Horizon Labs. Uh, there's this concept of like shift left. If you've ever heard it from like DevOps, it's always you try to get things shift left, like take care of automation earlier in, try to like find problems early on in, in the the development to the functional use. Uh, we think security is the same way. You you don't want it, it to be an afterthought where all right, we've coded, it's all good, it's done. All right, we're going to go live next month and let's do our security test. It's like, all right, what happens if we actually find something right before launch? It's going to like blow the whole you know date, the launch dates. And sometimes you'd say, well, we still have to go live and now you're going to go out vulnerable. You, you get one shot at a release sometimes before it's done. So we like it say as early as, as it makes sense to do security from, you know, maybe even before code, you want to do an architecture review. Like, is, does the architecture make a lot of sense? Is there any risks in the way we're thinking of the approach, uh, security awareness. So as you're building this, uh, you know, co secure code training, knowing how different NFTs work. If it's like in you know ERC seven twenty one, and think about the gas fees and you know how much it's going to cost. Like there's there's something to consider for security all the way from the very beginning up to the very end of the launch of securing the uh, the community involved. So uh, I have to say unbiasedly that security should be on, in every part of the process from the beginning. Yeah, I, I can agree more. I think security and making sure the code is audited is super crucial, right? And when we talk about um, the involvement of the security auditors uh, themselves, I think it's it's about as soon as the business requirements are identified and confirmed, I think that's the stage where we want to bring the auditors in, right? So we have some level of understanding of, as Steve was pointing out, how do we architect this, right? There could be a lot of value add and bringing them early and kind of brainstorming what are some of the potential vulnerabilities or the code issues that can arise 
as a result of the business requirements that have been frozen. And in some cases, you bring in when the code is complete, which is to say when the code is internally tested, but not yet released to the public, right? Yeah. So this is another great uh, point of interjection for auditors to come in, kind of help uh, identify vulnerabilities to see if there are any kind of backdoors that are available, which would be exploited once this things go into the wild. Because as you know, the nature of the space is technically anyone can go uh, and audit your code in the back end, right? Because it's available. So you don't want to be in public and then find a vulnerability after it's on the uh, in public eyes. And you want to make sure any open loops or holes that exist kind of get plugged in before uh, before it's released to the public. So I would say sooner the better. And over communicating in this case with the auditor is the uh, most <laughs> essential thing you can do. Oh yes, yeah. yeah. One of the first things we did with uh, with you guys when we uh, started to engage with the Horizon, it was um, the security awareness training on NFT vulnerabilities. So I asked Roberto, who's like front lines and sees all the latest hacks, sometimes finds these uh, himself. Uh, he's like, can you quickly put a list together of all of the latest NFT hacks and let's like make a, you know, what caused it and how to, uh, how, how can you prevent it? And, you know, we created kind of like these like top like vulnerability types and, and examples of them all that, you know, Roberto <laughs> did a great job of compiling all that to make it awareness training for it. And also uh, related to Rohan said that uh, I think that it's very important that any business requirement change is informed to the to the auditors, even even if it looks like it's a very minor change, right? It could cause like a critical functionality. And I can put you an example with this. Like I remember the first project that I ever minted. Uh, the project was really popular, and there were way too many people in the Discord that were going to take part in that public sale, and uh, basically everything went wrong after the, the, the public sale started. Uh, those guys uh, had like a limit of 10 uh, NFTs per wallet as a maximum. And, you know, all the whales were, were trying to mint 10, 10 NFTs. But what happened? The MetaMask has a default uh, gas limit uh, of like uh, 1 million and, two, uh, and 200,000 uh, GWA. So that's the default for MetaMask. And if you mint 10 NFTs, uh, the, gas for, the, the, the gas cost for minting 10 NFTs is exactly something like, uh, well, in that, contract, in that contract was exactly something like uh, 1 million, uh, 200,050, something like that, a little bit above the limit. So all those, all those wells uh, were getting their transaction reverted in Etherscan, they were losing a lot of money in the gas cost. And they were so mad that they were like, okay, this project, uh, I don't want to be part of this project. I want, I will not mint. So that's that's uh, that's how that project was ruined. And uh, after that, all the public sale, uh, people decided not to buy and they didn't manage to, to sell their total supply. Just because that single mistake, if they had put, instead of a limit of 10 NFTs, nine, that would not have happened and the project will have been much more successful. So, yeah. 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 I think this is a, um, one of the examples here, like a visual one from, from the training here is the, uh, gas, gas cost function greater than a default. Right. So you wow. can see here, if, uh, just like you're saying, Roberto, if you make a bundle and the gas cost is higher, you can end up like losing it and it'll just like revert and, and fail <laughs> for that. Maybe uh, you talk about like, you know, some of the, what we're looking at here and what happened. This is wild to see. Do you mind just giving me a little bit more? Hey, kind of, uh, I don't know. Uh, f can you explain like I'm five, if that's all right? Kind of what you see on the left and what's on the right here. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, on the left, you can see that MetaMask by default uh, has that gas limit, right? Mm -hmm. And on the right, you can see that the transaction was reverted because uh, the users, when using MetaMask, were using the default uh, configuration, the default configuration that, that MetaMask had. So they didn't put enough gas to, to mint those 10 NFTs. So the transaction failed. The, 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 the issue here was that the, that the developers didn't inform the users that they will have to manually go into MetaMask and modify this value. And yeah, people were really mad because, you know, when a transaction reverts, you are paying for the gas, but you're not getting the NFTs minted in your wallet. So they they were they probably lost uh, there something like uh, 
four hundred dollars in in just gas fees for nothing. Oof. Goodness. Oh. Yep, that's wrecked. So something to look for now. <laughs> so could I go out on a limb and say, hey, you know, these are the things that we can be aware of and be preemptive for with an auditor? Is that fair to say? Uh, and now, what can I ask? What what sort of is the criteria when you're looking for that? Audit. Is there anything that might be a red flag? Is there anything that might say, hey, these individuals really know what's up? Uh, is, is it just a matter of being in the know? Is it just a matter of being with it and in the scene? Or how is auditing an NFT and tokens different than any other projects that might be out there in the space? Sorry, I know there's a lot to unpack there, but I'd love to. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it makes a lot of sense here. Um, you know, showing some of these things here, it's, it's really for this particular example, it's like it's the code and seeing like, hey, is this. Uh, uh, is this code have a vulnerability here? Um, I see the, the screen here, like the particular one that's highlighted, you know, require number of tokens, max purchase, to keep going into one token. This would be something that you know, Roberto would find and be like, oh, this may be a gas limit, uh, you know, one mm -hmm. here. Is that right? And any other color to like this mint function here, Roberto, you would see? Uh, I don't see anything wrong in there at the moment. <laughs> yes, yes, you know, uh, the transaction revert. That was pretty yeah. good. <laughs> yep, that's it. But you can see on the bottom, like all the transactions for every for every ten min, yeah. uh, ten minutes, it would just fail, fail those those red ones on there for it. So that's like a you know a requirement for it is you know code prevention inside of the contract itself to you know make this not happen to users because uh, most of the time people minting NFTs are you know they're trusting that the code has been reviewed and audited or the developers you know have have thought this through and tested it and secured it. Um, they're not going to audit the code themselves and go mint mint things and check the gas limit. They're just going to go in and you know yellow in. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are even more things than the code that you should take into account, like how popular the project is. Like I, another example, like the, the there was an exploit uh, that was done the last year to an Adidas collection, and basically that collection that had like a limited supply, and there were too many people that uh, wanted to mint. And uh, basically what uh, one very smart guy did uh, was deploying a smart contract. From that smart contract, he deployed and over 20 or 30 smart contracts. And from those 30 smart contracts, he minted the NFT. So he managed to bypass the limit for each address. And he, uh, yeah, he spent a lot in gas cost, but he made a, a lot of profit there. Yeah, it's, it's also in those slides, yeah. Yeah. So maybe yeah, uh, we can. This is the the, the very famous uh, Adidas yeah. originals. Steve, do you mind uh, full screen in that one? Does it let you go? Hey, uh, take over the full screen for the slide. Yeah, I, I hit this one here. It's a uh, the restream <laughs> here when I hit the full screen. Let's see. Oh, oh it, it holds. Yeah, oh yeah, there's gotcha. a lot of code on this one. Let me uh, check this out. How's how's that look right now? Better. Coming there, I think so. I'm not sure if, <laughs> if it's not, another then, monitor. Uh, Take a screenshot yeah, and zoom in and blow it up. <laughs> I'm so used to Zoom, so I just like know what the Zoom's doing. It's the research full screen share of it all, but yeah, this is this is one for that. What what Roberto, was, you know, bypassing mint conditions uh, when it's executed, and yeah, I can zoom in here. How about this? We'll look at we'll look at uh, some of this here on the what's going on uh, down here, Roberto. We could we could explain this one. <laughs> Yeah, so there, there was a limit of like uh, users were able to mint a maximum of two NFTs uh, per, per wallet. So the attacker uh, was very smart and said, okay, so I just need a lot of different addresses. How can I get them? So the way to get those addresses was deploy a smart contract. From that smart contract, deploy uh, a lot of smart contracts. I think that it was more than 200 from what I read there. And now I have... Uh, 200 different addresses. So now let's make use of them. So he minted from those 200 smart contracts, two NFTs. And in a single transaction, he managed to mint 400 NFTs, around 400 NFTs. Now, you know what's so unique that... about this is it costs a lot of money to do this, like the gas fees for yeah. it. Like this one was a quarter million dollars in, in gas fee, but it's almost like a speculation aspect to it. And I was like, if I pay so much gas fee, is it you know, will the NFTs, you know, will it make a profit, you know, from, from owning th this many here too? <laughs> and he did, you know, around 600,000, I think, from all that. Eh? 
of world. Pretty crazy, yeah. Yeah, so that's it requires a little bit of a solidity development code knowledge to make a smart contract to generate these child contracts. And then after that, you know, use that child contract to purchase it and pretty much it was like, how did somebody buy it so fast? It must be a bot. Well, not not really a bot. It's a, it's a smart contract it's, that's doing it for you. I see yeah. one question um, that has kind of come through in the chat. And I don't know if, hey, if you'll be able to interpret it in the right way. But there's a question, hey, how do you prevent something like that if, if, if they are all unique addresses? Um, does that extrapolate well in your mind? Or what are you thinking? Yeah, well, you yeah. can just uh, force in the smart, in the smart contract uh put a require statement in the smart contract that uh checks that tx origin is the same as message sender so basically with what you do with that require statement is that you are not allow you are not allowing any smart contract to to do calls into your nft project smart contract so you can avoid that yeah that's it you can see in the slide mm -hmm. yeah that first one extra code cool. <laughs> yeah, so TX, TX origin, uh, what you know, you're saying, what Roberto saying is like, make sure that the message center, the person sending the request to purchase that, to, to mint it, um, it's, if you make a child smart contract from the original request, then that address is going to be different. You're going to create, uh, Roberto, you mentioned like 200 addresses, like child addresses from that. So that's not, it's like, not like whitelisted in a way. So you want to make sure that the origin is the original call, so it's only one time. And I think there's a couple other preventative things too, right? These these other two, Roberto, are, are ways to protect it. There is another way that is, uh, yeah, the second point that is so in the slide, but there is a way to bypass that one, uh, oh. <laughs> which is uh, by minting from the constructor of the smart contract. That will bypass that. So the the safest way here is, I guess that's that's the only safe way to to avoid this is the the first point. The second can be bypassed. Wow. The, the ever-changing world of, of blockchain security, where <laughs> <laughs> zero days every day. <laughs> well, hey, huge props for uh, a little bit of that engagement and interaction in the chat. Uh, I think that was pretty cool to hey, just get a little uh, extracurricular thing to, to sneak in there. Um, Are we scaring you, Rohan? We're like, this is... No, <laughs> I think this is, this is great. Now, from what I'm trying to see is this is the kind of work we really need to put in to make sure projects that are super big and... Uh, going to the market, they go out in the right way. And that's where security plays such a massive role. Yeah. That is the uh, next thread I kind of wanted to tug on, if that's all right, Rohan, because, I, I, hey, I wanted to pivot back to you, give you some more time in the limelight here. But can I ask whether it's you or if it's your developers or it's all the other hands in the mix of putting together this project and eventually going out for launch, are, are these all things that you're always cognizant of do you remember each of all these odds and ends of hey whether you're carving this out in solidity or rust etc or is that again the sheer value in getting the audit and getting more people kind of understanding how this thing is baked and built together under the hood yeah i think um by the nature of the industry and the space that we operate in these questions are super critical right from the get-go right because mm. one of the core aspects of partnering with Horizon Labs and in, uh, in conjunction with Talborn, we want to make sure that the partners that we bring on, they're getting the best service, the best launch experience for their specific projects, right? And the security and auditing plays a very critical role because we don't want to have experiences where we're launching out with a project and eventually it gets either get hacked or there's some sort of a, a, a 51% attack or some sort of uh, aspect that blows up the entire project because there's a huge reputational risk that's at play, both for the project that has developed a community of followers who want to see them succeed, and for us here at Horizon Labs, and by virtue of which all our uh, vendors and third parties that we interact with and Talbon being uh, one of them, to make sure there's no reputational risk for our business as well. So we want to go out with the approach where we are safeguarding the reputation of both our partners and uh, and and our and and our you know third party vendors and partners, including security, some of the institutional partners, as well as contributors who help kind of bring that uh, you know launch to life. So it's super critical. We think about it on a daily basis, and it is aspect of our project launch mechanism from day one itself. Yep, definitely part. Yeah, 
part of also working with uh, you know a security vendor. You know, we we have perspective into hundreds of different projects that have uh, different types of vulnerabilities, different flavors of of NFTs or smart contracts. Um, you know, Halborn, we 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 do auditing not just for you know Ethereum based uh, contracts. We we we're, uh, we do Solana, um, so you know those are uh, programs in Rust, and so there's a lot of variation and a lot of different you know security issues that can come at a code level. You know that may apply on one but not the other. But that broad perspective of different approaches from different developers, different teams. You know our our, our customers like you know Horizon. You guys get that benefit. So we get those different perspectives to come and say, hey, you guys are doing great, but. We uh, we just audited this one last month, and uh, we work, you know we recommend that you prevent it in this way. Um, so you're kind of getting all this the sums of all of that together in, in one output to uh, provide the extra value for it. Yeah, so you know that's part of the fun fun involved with it all to help you know give you uh, what you need to make sure it's secure. Yeah, and also for Horizon Labs, since we're agnostic of the blockchain, we help our partners build on. This is where Albon and the expertise come into play, right? So whether you're building on Solana, whether it's on Polygon or Ethereum or whatever underlying uh, blockchain it be, security aspects may vary uh, slightly <laughs> from uh, you know code to code, whether you're building on Rust or is it Solidity and so forth. So we want to be able to provide the simpler, simple but yet secure solution to our provider, uh, to our to our partners. That means the robustness in the smart contracts is a key contributor when it comes to the overall security, right? That's provided by the underlying blockchain technology. So it's super critical from that lens too. Yep. Sometimes we'll, we'll see projects uh, that we come in. Well, we I've seen them before, but just not really doing smart contracts. Like, hey, look at my NFT collection, and it's just a bunch of like images on an S3 bucket. It's like, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hey, thanks. I know we've been chatting a little bit about more on the security aspect of it in a very abstract way, uh, but I'd love to kind of boil it down if that's all right, because uh, getting to the specifics here, right? What What is ApeCoin, if I may? What's the utility of ApeCoin? How does that bring or what does that change for the Board Ape Yacht Club? Uh, what value would that strategically bring? If I could kind of pick on you, Rohan, a little bit more. Yeah, so I think uh, the utility is a critical question when you're launching a fungible token, not just ApeCoin in this scenario, right? So when you think more broadly of what a fungible token launch looks like, you always want to tie it down to the utility that comes with it for the broader community. Um, whether it be launching a game, whether it's about thinking about the metaverse, whether it be about the governance aspects or staking, all of those essentially become part of the broader question of the fungible token launch and the utility that underlies. So in eight points, for instance, those were some of the critical points we thought about, talked to, what does that utility look like at day one and beyond and what the community itself can do with it. So those are some of the critical underlying utility questions you want to talk, talk about when you think about uh, a fungible token launch, so to speak. Yeah, so you know, the ApeCoin it, itself, um, you know, this is something, uh, the utility, it's a governance token is like the functionality for it. And, you know, governance uh, token, it, there's a concept of a DAO, which is like a decentralized autonomous organization. And uh, that's, it's essentially think of it as like a voting ticket. So by owning ApeCoin, you can participate in a, a governance board or a voting committee. Uh, it's a membership that uh, can, you know, as you see here, like, you know, explain itself to um, communicate. You'll be able to pick different projects. Uh, a, a DAO, what they do is they submit proposals. Uh, so um, all of the holders of, of ApeCoin will have proposed like, hey, what kind of sponsorship do we want to get next? You know, which clubs should we have our membership uh, party at? And uh, people that have the um, you know have these coins, they can you know submit uh, you know their votes on the, the different proposals. So think of it as a uh, like a democracy in a way. And and the more coins you have, the more uh, <laughs> the more the more vote power um, that you can have. So that's that's really what a governance uh, you know token is used for. Um, other ones on there are yeah you know, yeah like Uniswap. They had a governance token, Uni, uh, you know, to talk about. So it's really drives. Um, you know, pretty much drives the future of you know, you know of what's going on with Acoin, and um, I think there's a couple of proposals right now that are out there. So you know, like ecosystem fund allocation and the process, you know, one year budget. So these are all 
all things that um you know you, you can even see like how many people are against or in favor of it so uh 15 million eight coins uh or holders of eight coins voted in favor and wow. 113 there so these uh, this is what eight coin does this is the utility uh, of of um eight coin here and uh you know what it's really used for i think that is fascinating because in my mind it gives you basically a seat at the table like hey you're you're on the board of directors here is that is that the right understanding yep. yeah that's yeah that's a, the concept of a DAO and that DAO is it's not unique to just ApeCoin itself it's you know a DAO is a very novel concept that um, has been around since like the early days of Ethereum and think of it as a way to decentralize or democratize uh, you know voting for things so mm -hmm. Um, you know, the ape coin is not a NFT itself. There's a particular, uh, you know, standard for, for what that is and the governance token, but that's, um, it's part of that whole ecosystem for it. So now you have an NFT, uh, and the people that own the NFTs, you know, the, the mutant apes and the board apes, they were given, uh, an, a certain allocation of the ape coin at the launch. So that, that, that was what uh, we had helped pr to protect. So, um, and it's based on like the value of it. So you were given this. If you have a board ape, then you have higher vote power than a mutant ape uh, because of the value. So you become, you know, your votes are a bit more important because you have more at stake, you know, with the community or with the project here. Um, so it's yeah, it's a total ecosystem fund. Um, I can link this to security because you can do governance wrong too. <laughs> this is something that's uh, the largest hack early days of Ethereum was on the DAO, which was a crowdfunding thing. We can talk about that, you know. If you'd like to later on, but that's a whole another, you know, how to secure your DAO. This would be the next topic. <laughs> yeah, and, and just to Steve's point, right? Especially in the DAO, it's almost akin to setting up your own nation state in a way. To so think of the early days of when you're banning a group of followers and contributors together to carve out, um, you know, the governance systems. Like how should certain things be governed? What should be built? How it should be built? Who should be charged? these tokens essentially enable you to do that um, in, 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 in DAO itself, right? And the community as a whole has a voice as to what gets built, what doesn't get built. So as you saw the AIPs one, two, five, those are those proposals that were set forth and the community and the voters who were the holders of those uh, uh, ApeCoin were able to vote whether they want to move forward with a certain proposal or not. And the next comes the execution. Mm -hmm. so. Yep, and yeah, security relates that there's um, been instances of you know, malicious proposals. So they all, you know, it's a majority attack. It would be the uh, vulnerability cavity for that, where the majority of uh, eight coin holders can outvote the rest of them to say, hey, we want to put a proposal where um, these people get all of the eight coins and these people don't. And then 51, you know, 52, whatever people vote for that. And all of a sudden, like majority attack. It's like, I, I took over the board of the directors here. <laughs> Can I ask which of those potential oh mistakes, missteps, gotchas might be the most common, uh, or, or what is if there is even such a thing as like low hanging fruit or the most yeah. likely, most common thing that hey could be whoops we totally didn't foresee that in our launch or whatever that we're working through. Uh, what would be the best advice uh, and best things to look for and, and look look out towards? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start to give my perspective on it and then let the, uh, the uh, other security expert here uh, chime in on a, for, for a DAO specifically like this and for let's talk eight coin, then we'll go to NFTs for eight coin. Um, malicious proposal is not necessarily intended though. So you do an upgrade to the contract. Like we figured out that the formula of distributions uh, doesn't work too well and we want to change the reward allocation a bit and they change the code. And then they vote on the code like, yep, yep, this makes sense. Everybody votes for it. It gets put out there. And then it's actually exploitable. There's a flaw in that upgrade. And uh, this happened to Compound. Uh, uh, it compounds a big um, you know, token that's out there. But they also have like a rewards and lending and, and, and distribution. There was a flaw in the Compound hack. And they had to, uh, you know, the proposal was flawed in the way they did the rewards. So that's the most common. Um, and I think uh, that that we, you know, it's something that you could see uh, pretty clearly if you really like take the time and have like a, a, a proposal audited before it goes into. Now, what's your perspective, Roberto, on like common things maybe on NFTs that you see? I'm super yeah. keen on Roberto's because I know, hey, yeah. you're on the front lines there. What do you yep. think? Yeah, he's the from code my, master. <laughs> from my past experience related to DAOs, uh, the main problem perhaps is uh, flash loans. Like, uh, 
some user takes a flash a flash loan, increase its voting power, and in the same in all in the same trans transaction, he managed to uh, create a malicious proposal, vote for it, and you know he has so much voting power because he just took a flash loan that the the proposal will be approved automatically. So he can just take control of the whole contract, or no one will be able to to stop him. That that's one of the main uh, vulnerabilities that uh, can usually be found in in DAOs. And related to NFT projects, uh, here it's not very common to see a hack where you can just drain all the ether in the smart contract or uh, where you can just mint for free. That's not very common. Uh, the most common bugs here in the NFT uh, projects are more related to, let's say that there is a total supply or 1,000 tokens. Mm, an attacker exploits a rentancy and manage to mint uh, to to uh, bypass that total supply of 1,000 tokens. Or, for example, uh, if the NFT project is using uh, some uh, different logic, like generating random numbers and so on. Mm, people can abuse this, and it it can really get uh, it can it can get very bad. Like I I saw one project. This was not this one. Not, this was not a hardware audit. Uh, I was I I usually follow some NFT projects, and one day I just saw a message in 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 a Discord chat, and I uh, people were talking about uh, oh there is this project here that uh, it's giving people back the the price that they pay after they mean there is a chance that you recover uh, what you paid for that uh, for, for that NFT. Uh, and I was like, uh, let me check that smart contract and see how they implemented this. And yeah, I checked the smart contract and I immediately saw that uh, that contract was vulnerable. Um, basically, they were generating a random number, as you can see now in the screen, which uh, the block timestamp, block difficulty, and the address of the... Well, in this case, this is the exploit itself. It, they were using the address of the of the people that was minting. So as soon as I saw that that code, I forked the mainnet and I tried to build an exploit for it in my fork environment to see if I was able to exploit it. And I managed to uh, well, I don't want to get too technical here, but there is a function in Solidity called create two that allows you to pre-compute the address that the smart contract is going to get uh, without even deploying. So what I did was creating a smart contract and I created a function that was in a loop calling the, the grade two until I got an address that was winning that little yeah. lottery that, that was there. And once I won that lottery, I called the NFT contract and managed to get uh, to trick what they call there, the Santa algorithm and get back uh, the price. And they they did not only have that bug, they have an extra bug there, which was rentrancy. So I could uh, co uh, put together those two bugs, the rentrancy and the, uh, the weak uh, random number generation. And with that exploit, I, I could uh, drain all the funds in the, in the smart contract. So as soon as I have that, loop it, loop it, and then when you're done with your loop, go back into it again and loop it again, and then go back to this. Loop the loop. <laughs> yeah. So basically, uh, you could drain all the all the ether that was in the contract that at what time was like uh, six ether, I guess. Wow. And yeah, I sent a message to the to the to the owners of the project in Discord, and as soon as I told them that, they stopped that function. Luckily, they, they, they had put to, to stop it, and it was luckily it, it was not exploited, and they were very thankful for that. But uh, you can things can get really really bad if if you are adding some extra functionality like this one. Yeah. Yep. This I is think it, that we see John and Ron uh, each day here. It's um, yeah, we like to protect everybody, uh, protect the world from these like really complicated novel uh, hacks here, and it's uh, you know. I think it's providing a lot of like value, helping helping everybody with this, and you know, letting the whole community kind of uh, rise and, and embrace this, rather than having it be <laughs> wild wild west of like complete like losses and and you know people losing their funds because everyone works hard for this stuff too. So it's a uh, protects like the uh, the paladins of code <laughs> for it. <laughs> yeah, 
I mean, yeah, it exactly is the wild, wild west, right? So, and it just gives you more perspective as to why we work with partners like Alborn to provide that security blanket um, when we're working with different projects because there's so much still to be discovered. As you said, Steve, like every day is day, day one in terms of development and security breaches. You never know what can happen. So super grateful to have you as a partner as well. Definitely, yeah. When we're, we're trying to build some tools too, like easier to use tools. Uh, we're doing in, in security, there's a lot of uh, you know, preventative you know, services to pen test and risk assessments. And you know, these are services that using our brain power. And um, you know, we've been working on t- some, some tools, some products that will help all this stuff as well. So those, be, those are soon to come here and uh, hopefully that'll add even more value for everybody to be able to uh, you know, gra- u- utilize to you know, protect their own, their own funds or projects to protect it for their communities. Well, I'm really glad you kind of, in my mind, you hit the nail on the head there with kind of a couple of those last sentiments, Steve, is like, hey, you know what, like, this could have all gone way, way south, right? When you find a vulnerability, when you see some potential weakness or flaw, uh, and and to Roberto's credit, hey, you kind of do responsible disclosure like hey, you go tell the maintainers and the organizers, hey, something's up, uh, and you are coming in as the good Samaritan to kind of solve that problem before stuff really blows up and money is down the drain. Uh, So kudos to you and all that front. And uh, I'm very, very happy to hear that. And I love especially that notion you had there. Uh, And on the, on the scenes that I am with in the cybersecurity space, they say a rising tide raises all ships. Correct. Uh, And that's That's why we do this education. That's, uh, that's why we get this information out there. And I'm so glad everyone's here to learn a thing or two just as well. (laughs) We love education. That's the, that's the fun part of all of this is it's so new. People are still, you know, learning these things and you can learn by mistakes, of course. Uh, um, And it's, the experience that uh, helps you like grow to be more secure. Um, myself and everybody at Halborn, we we love you know Web three. We love blockchain. We love the all of the problems that it can solve, but also all of the new things that it's uh, it's creating uh, for opportunities or you know community development for gaming. And uh, we we want to see it succeed. So you know having security is a uh, one one way to provide you know value and help change the, the ecosystem a bit because it is very new. Uh, Coming from the traditional security world, John, like yourself and me, it's the, the approach is just, you know, used to have to go in and into a network and like move laterally after phishing to steal the credit cards out from Active Directory. And <laughs> then you could sell it for like a couple, like five bucks on the, the black market. But now it's, uh, hey, I found one line of code and uh, $200 million in a transaction. All done. All in day, black, yeah. black hat days work. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hey, friends, I think we're maybe at uh, 10 minutes left until the top of the hour. So what I think, and and, and I want to leave the uh, open floor for you to tell me if, hey, maybe we could go in another direction. But I'd love to do one last, hey, round robin, ask what what are your parting thoughts? What are your last words and advice on, hey, what what is the best thing to do when you're successfully launching your own NFT, whether it's security, whether it's tokenomics, et cetera. Um, and then I think maybe we could take some time for, for questions. If any, if anyone did have anything in the chat, anything we just want to grab onto and chat about a little bit more. Um, everyone are you okay with that? Or is there a different direction we should go for the last couple of minutes? Go okay. for it. Silence <laughs> yeah. means yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm reading through the questions right now. I'm going to see which ones uh, I can answer Perfect. here. And Ro, yeah, Ro, I want to see the, the, launch, the launch question, and I'll see if I can find a technical question here in the chat. Cool. Can I ask, hey, what are your parting thoughts, if I may? I would say do your own research on a lot of things here. Um, you know, there's a lot of, like, Twitter like nonsense that I see all the time. Like I, I can't escape. Like one Twitter post ends up with like fifty like comments on like whatever this thing is here. You know, yeah. the blockchain and, and Web three is open and permissionless and, and decentralized, which is a good thing, but it can be a bad thing too. Anybody can mint a, any token. They can even find ones that look like others. So if you ever like go on OpenSea, the amount of bored apes like <laughs> there are just uh, there, everybody has one uh, on the outside and looking at it, you know, the, the, the non-fungible one, the originals that was made by Yuga Labs that we protected, that's, you know, it, that's, that's the real, but people get tricked. 
they see it's like oh that's the eighth i saw that on tv oh i saw that this is the one and they they buy it thinking they're getting a good deal so you know that's permissionless anybody can make their own nft and, and they can take the images and, and do what they want with it but you know do your research make sure you know what you're what you're buying what you're getting involved in i think that's a big, big takeaway yeah i, I think i 100 percent agree with what steve uh mentioned here and on top of that like it's so easy to mint the token these days right you have so many different launch pads and anyone can go and mint it i think the projects that are typically successful are the ones who put in the effort to figure out what are the security aspects underlying are we doing things the right way do we have a proper project roadmap or a timeline based on which things uh, will come whether it be multiple different nft drops or do you have a token on the roadmap or is there a dao and openly communicating with uh, with the community that that's that's part of your ecosystem as well. And lastly, is what's the utility that you tend to offer? Because more often than not, what you realize is beyond the security and the smart contract development, because it's such a tech heavy space, you often miss what's the utility or the business or the or the value proposition you're offering, right? And it's very easy to get misguided and and just try to avoid the entire ocean. Uh, so it's very critical you think critically about what's that utility you're able to offer and then design the tokenomics or the metanomics behind it in a way that that aligns with that future vision, not the other way around. I agree. And uh, I wouldn't be able to uh, end end a stream anyways without, uh, you know, showing showing our ape. Yeah, so... <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> yeah, here is uh and i you know make sure that i bought the right one right so, <laughs> so here's uh our our halborn board that we have here 7390 excellent oh beautiful <laughs> yeah i think that horizon is uh it aped in too yeah <laughs> we did yes we did we have i wish i had the uh access to it i would love to show but we have an astronaut ape so <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, to verify, you know, do I have the right one? You know, this is all on the blockchain, so you can go to the contract address and verify that it's uh, the, you know, the correct Bripia Club token here. Okay, and then uh, and there, look at the code. It's all this is the back end, you know, for for the apes. Uh, and so you know, see twenty one transaction. You can see all the the you know, trades going on for those NFTs. So you know, verify it, you know, that way to make sure it's not, uh, something random. I'm sure the or Ape Yacht Club itself has received many, uh, a you know, apes itself <laughs> for that, that are not the true apes here, you know, in its own wallet. So yeah, um, OpenSea, luckily they have the blue check mark now, go for it, just like you know, Twitter and stuff. So that helps as well. Yeah, that kind of is the lowest hanging fruit, if you will, right? Like, so you can name whatever project, call another Board Ape Yacht Club, and you don't see that blue check mark. And I think that's a good enough red flag just from a basic layman security challenge, right? So yeah. definitely looking out for those signals. That's the one that I needed. I, I, I needed the blue check mark to know. So, I mean, I, that's good lessons learned for me, at least. Uh, you're going to you know, want to audit the code and verify it on Etherscan, John? We'll, we'll get you there. You shouldn't really uh, trust that much, that blue, uh, that blue oh, yeah? check mark. Yeah? There, there was okay. tags around it uh, still. So. Oh, I, I take that back. I take that good back. can of worms at the very end. Good, good. I, I don't remember exactly the website where they did it, but some some people managed to create a ERC20 token in, in a website and they put like some characters in the name and the, the token appeared with the with that check mark in the in the exchange and you know people were buying that uh that ERC20 token and uh, they lost their money. <laughs> Wow, so, they, yeah, take the, uh, like the UTF code translation of that blue check mark to render it on front end. That's brilliant. <laughs> Gentlemen, I think we have the topic for our next webinar together, right? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. That's good show good. for that one. Speed well, cool. Roberto for uh, any security checks on NFT purchases. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, tricky. I mean, it all comes down to this. Social engineering is always going to be there. You know, People, unfortunately, are usually the weakest link in social engineering. Uh, phishing has always been the number one way to get like a foot on there with all this, you know, technical code and finding a, an exploit or RCE. You know, those are always like very uh, elite, so to speak. But um, what hits people the most is just a simple, I click the link. And, um, you know, this is kind of like a new version of that where it's, you know, people, I joined the Discord and bought, bought the fake one. <laughs> 
Mm. <laughs> cool. Well, um, yeah, so that's that's my thoughts on, on all of it here. Yeah, it, if we have any questions here, the in interesting ones that you see, John, that maybe we should go into? Uh, there was one I thought I think would be really kind of nice to touch on, but only if you're comfortable with it, right? There was a, a notion, hey, are, are there other companies that do cybersecurity on blockchain or other Web3 projects, right? Who could it be? other auditors, et cetera. Obviously, hey, I do want to sing the yeah. praises of Halborn, but uh, there hey, are others, yeah, right? Listen, uh, and there's, it's, uh, we've done collaborations and peer reviews with others. Hey, it's always, pen, when you auditing and testing is an art, and every artist has their own approach uh, to it. So there's nothing wrong with getting multiple audits. I mean, even on the, on, um, the with Horizon Labs, you know, there was the other artist partners. We never shy away from that. You know, I think that means they really care about it. You know, it's a, uh, it's, uh, trust trust it but verify you know type of thing so having multiple verifications is fine for us and um you know some of the some of them we've worked with before uh sometimes we refer them to others because it's, it's something we don't do like you know, we don't do um forensics you know right much right now or go and chasing down the bad guys so yeah you know, we refer that to them and then others don't do you know rust testing and we do so i think it's a it's always okay to to get multiple perspectives on that you said a key word uh, some time ago, maybe at the halfway point during our time together, that was a uh, defense in depth. Um, yes. And that's another, hey, awesome, great uh, security stamp that I think is important to hone in on. And when you're chatting about trust, but verify, and we're, we're talking about, oh, those social engineering, deception, phishing schemes. Uh, I know all of this sounds like, hey, you know, boiler, boring boilerplate cybersecurity hygiene, uh, but this doesn't go away. Um, even, yeah. hey, we've got this exciting new frontier with the whole Web3 stuff and the tokens and everything yeah. that we're launching, but uh, it, it's it's not moving over and we still got to embrace it. We still got to keep it the together. Fundamentals are still there. Yeah, still, still the uh, CIA triad of confidentiality, <laughs> integrity, availability. You know, if, if your funds aren't in the pool or your NFT is not there anymore, it's an availability problem. <laughs> Well, all righty, everyone. I know we are closing in at the top of the hour. So, uh, hey, let me start to tune this thing out. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Rohan, Steve, Roberto. This has been incredible. Uh, I, for one, have learned a lot. And uh, hey, I, that's just me. I hope everyone listening in, I hope everyone that's been uh, tuning into this has also gained some new insight, gained some value. And thank you, thank you, thank you for sprinkling in all those visuals, all those extra, hey, anecdotes on the codes, et cetera. Uh, so I'd love to see a quick outpouring in the chat. Hey, thanks. For all of us getting together and doing this thing this has been wonderful guys thank you thank you <laughs> thank you thank you thanks Bye, rohan thanks for uh, nice seeing you again thanks about it until next Thank time you. everyone take care